Okay. Good morning. Perhaps we can start the morning session today. So Mukundu is going to give his third lecture. So please. Morning, everybody. So <clears throat> I want to quickly remind you where we were yesterday and uh, continue on from there. There'll be some new elements. Uh, I'll, I'll add some sp special facts that are um, specific to thermal states of field theories, and then uh, take a detour and spend some time reviewing what we know about hydrodynamics. Okay? That will set, set the stage for the fourth lecture, where we'll put all these things together and construct something uh, for the low energy theory of hydrodynamics. OK, so what I convinced you yesterday was basically the fact that quantum field theory asking general questions of all possible time orderings requires the consideration of uh, an interesting class of contours for the path integral, contours that wind back and forth in time. You can call them time folds, out of time ordered contours, et cetera, et cetera. And I gave you the, fi the, the, the general lesson that these contours, while they encode lots of information, they also come in inbuilt with an inherent amount of redundancy. And in the specific case of the schwinger keldysh contour that computes time-ordered and slightly out of time-ordered correlators, I argued that there's a useful way to encode this redundancy in terms of some kind of topological symmetry. I'll come back to that point in a, in a while, but let me specialize to a special case first of just talking about states of a quantum system which are thermal. Now, depending on where your intuition comes from, you think of thermal states as either some quantum system coupled to some reservoir if you're doing stat mech, or, um, or you could just say, well, I have a system which is in a density matrix, which is simply given by the function of the Hamiltonian so that the states are distributed according to some Boltzmann weighting, and it's normalized. If you want to normalize this density matrix, you can normalize it by the partition function. Usually, I prefer not to normalize this density matrix so that its trace actually computes the partition function. So let me not do this, which is what we were doing yesterday. We were normalizing our density matrices so that here I would just say trace of rho beta is um, z. Okay, and uh, if you want to sort of add, add in lots of bells and whistles, you want to turn, you have conserved charges, you want to put chemical potentials, you can free, feel free to do so. But for the sake of discussion, keep it simple and, and keep the formulae compact. I'll just talk about just thermal field theory with no chemical potentials. Now, we are also used to the fact that uh, when you talk about thermal field theory, this is talk, talking about equilibrium of some quantum system. Um, in statistical mechanics, it's just the equilibrium of some classical system. But uh, there's one interesting fact that I want to draw your attention to, which is usually you think of this, this, this problem as saying you put your quant because of the fact that the, de that the density matrix is given in terms of the Hamiltonian, you could just ask for the schwinger keldysh contour, which computes response, okay, let, let me call it one OTO correlators, keeping true to our notation from yesterday, you can think of that contour as starting out at some fiducial time, exploring the real time segments, comes back as it was doing yesterday, but now to account for this e to the minus beta h, I could just draw a vertical segment of length roughly i beta. If this is epsilon, then this is really i beta minus epsilon, but I'm imagining that this is infinitesimal. So this excursion in imaginary time is i beta. Okay. And th this, this fact is simply special to this density matrix because 
the thing that does the evolution, the Hamiltonian, is the same thing that appears in the density matrix. So this is a stationary density matrix. Its Heisenberg evolution doesn't change. It's time independent by construction. Now, usually what one does tend to do is tends to view the temperature as constant throughout space. There is no time dependence because this density matrix is stationary. D by D, D rho of D rho beta of dt is zero um, by Heisenberg equations of motion. But you could do something slightly non-trivial, and I won't exploit this in what, what, I, what I'm going to say later. So let me tell you this, this useful fact. So I can ask you the question, what is the general thermal equilibrium configuration? And by this, I mean I'm, I'm going to allow myself to turn on background sources, which will allow me to change the temperature, if you like, from place to place in space. But it's going to keep the density matrix stationary. So, <clears throat> so usually, we consider homogeneous configurations. where the temperature is constant in space. But with no loss of generality, you can choose temperature to vary as a function of x. But more importantly, you can do something more. You can choose. So when I say you have a temperature in, in Lorentz signature space-time, you're doing relativistic quantum field theory after all, I mean that you go to a local inertial frame, you go to a point, and you ask, what is the temperature? And what, in which local inertial frame are you measuring the temperature? Okay, it means basically means a question of, what do you mean by your direction of time at that point? But I could make my local inertial frame vary as I go along in space. There's nothing preventing me from doing that. As long as there's no explicit time dependence, the, the density matrix is still stationary. So the most general stationary configuration <coughs> is one where I allow temperature to vary as a function of x and also rotate my inertial frame. in which I'm measuring this temperature, OK? And this is very easy to encode. It simply amounts to turning on a background gravitational field, a spatial gravitational field. And we all know this, but we don't tend to use this. The atmosphere is in equilibrium, but the atmosphere is not in equilibrium with a constant temperature. The temperature varies up at, as we go across the atmosphere. You can, you've, you've worked this out in your standard undergraduate thermodynamics course. But you can do this not just in the, in the, in the altitude, but across the space. And, and, and that's the most general configuration. And so I could just declare that this is quantum field theory in some background. Geometry. with a time-like killing field and I need this time-like killing field to ensure that it's in equilibrium, there's no time dependence, so I'll call this time-like killing field k mu and without loss, you can just parameterize this by some time coordinate t if you like and then the spatial, ge the geometry of space-time on which our quantum field theory lives is just simply takes the colors of Klein-like form an index m here to indicate that this is a spatial index. Okay. 
and I have put, I've written down a, a Lorentz signature metric here. The main difference is that this time coordinate torques around as you go around in space. It's not, it's a, it's a stationary killing field, not a static killing field. And you have spatial dependence in A's, sigmas, and gammas. Okay, the local temperature is set in terms of this prefactor sigma, but the local inertial frame choice cares about this AI. And the reason to do this is that later when we want to sort of talk about co various configurations, you'll see that it's very useful to use this as, our, uh, as, as a tool to extract how the system, the, the, our quantum field theory response to these kind of geometries. So if I put a quantum field theory on a curved space or curved space time, the response is measured by asking what is the energy momentum tensor of the, of the, of the, of the field theory when it's subject to this background. So of course, you know, all the field configurations will sort of align themselves to be in equilibrium, but they'll have to sort of align themselves subject to this nonlinear source. Okay? And, and that, that will allow us to extract the nonlinear response, the energy momentum tensor, as a functional of the source. We later generalize to allowing ourselves to not just consider source backgrounds which are space dependent, but also time dependent, but for now we're just talking about equilibrium, so I'm going to only keep space dependence. Okay. okay. The Euclidean geometry of this, if I, because T is a killing field, you can imagine sort of looking at the spatial sections. On the, on the, on the spatial sections, so you can think of this as a, the Euclidean analog. is you have spatial geometry sigma, which is the restriction of this manifold at constant time slice, so let's call this manifold M. And you can imagine that there is a circle vibration of a Euclidean thermal circle of local period beta of xm, which is related to sigma and local twist given by ai of xm. And in pictures, one usually talks about thermal equilibrium as if you have some space and you have a cylinder where you have a circle of period beta that sort of is homogeneous everywhere in space. But I'm advocating a more complicated setup where you have a vibration structure with the thermal circle changing its shape and size as you go along. The statement of equilibrium is simply that if you take this geometry and this Euclidean geometry, which is the analytic continuation of this guy, and slice it on any section, nothing changes. You can pick any section of this geometry, and physics is invariant because it was time independent to begin with. <coughs> okay, so that's the background, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. But for now, let's try to ask, given this density matrix, what does it imply for correlation functions? Because that's what we were talking about yesterday. Okay. So I have this contour, and you can generalize much of what I'm saying to the KOTOs, but you, you can, again, for a KOTO, you would draw this back and forth, and then eventually, as you've gone down all the way, you'd go down another I beta. Okay. So, 
There's a useful fact about quantum field theories for correlators in a thermal state. I have to say one thing, they are analytic in imaginary time. In the domain of width beta. That, that domain in the lower half plane on a strip of width beta. And it's actually easy to see this. Um, and again, we can play the games we were playing yesterday to see this, but I'll write one, one identity and tell you how to see the remaining identities by just playing the games we were playing yesterday. So the usual statement you would see is that this implies what's called the kubo martin schwinger condition or the KMS condition, as it's commonly known. That the correlator of two operators, one inserted at imaginary time with a location i beta, and the other at zero, is the same as To be consistent, I have to put hats here from my notation from yesterday. There's a very easy way to intuit this. Let's say T is uh, positive. Okay. So the time-ordered correlator has A here, let's say, and B here. So let's say, let, let's say we're talking about the, the other guy, the anti-time ordered correlator. So this is A, this is B. Um, sorry, what am I doing? A is here, B, B, B should be here. You can sort of imagine doing a, playing, pl playing a simple trick of sliding A through rho beta, which conjugates it to T minus I beta. It's, it's just cyclically rearranging these guys, and you can keep going through by just seeing how it works on this contour of, of moving operators around as long as they're unobstructed to get these kind of relations. So, because A of T minus I beta is simply E to the plus beta H rho of A hat of T, minus beta h, which of course is nothing but rho beta inverse a hat of t. Rho beta. Okay. So the statement is that given a correlator in thermal equilibrium, because the thermal density matrix does evolution in imaginary time, you can conjugate operators through and keeping true to this statement of analyticity requires you to conjugate them this way. Okay. Requires you to conjugate with rho inverse in front. Conjugating up in imaginary time would have been rho beta A, rho beta inverse, but that runs into trouble with this domain of analyticity. Okay. So I, I'll consistently only move my operators down in imaginary time when I apply the KMS rules. I won't move them up in imaginary time. This is not what you would find, for example, in the literature. So in much of the StatMech literature, you also see conjugation by J 
say rho beta to the half, which moves a of t to a hat of t plus i beta over 2. But I, I, I won't go through that. I'll tell you something about this in, in a second. But. OK. Now, let me use what we had yesterday. And again, motivated by trying to go down to the low energy theory, try to recast this in a language that's amenable to a general treatment. Okay? Again, these statements are true if you know what your density matrix is, if you know what your microscopics is. But I, eventually, I want to sort of unanchor myself from this microscopic description and ask what's happening in the low energy theory. Okay? So I start here and tell you that there's a following set of statements. This KMH condition. More generally, I, I've only given it to you for two-point functions, but you can derive it for higher point function, implies a set of thermal sum rules among which you can say the following, that the schwinger keldish time ordering of the following set of correlators is also zero. So I insert in the schwinger keldish contour some right operator. And I insert a left operator. I'll put a tilde here just here. But not, not at real time, but at a shifted imaginary time. Yesterday, I gave you a very similar identity for difference operators. The key was both operators at the same time location, the right and left operator. In the thermal state, there's another identity where the left operator can be conjugated down to minus to t minus i beta. Yeah? Oh, m labels these operators, sorry. It's a product of operators of this kind. Thank you. <clears throat> let me come up with a notation which is useful. So let me call O tilde L just the operator O L at t minus i beta, which of course is obtained by this conjugation. And let me denote for future reference this guy as the action of some differential operator, which I have to define for you, on OL of t. Okay. So delta beta is just some mnemonic for doing this uh, conjugation. The conjugation, of course, will involve, if you, if you write this out, this involves some Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff. You sort of expand out the exponential, and you'll have nested commutators. You can think of those nested commutators as some kind of derivative action. And I just call the derivative action minus del beta. Okay. I, I want to write this because later on I'll, I'll make some simplification with these kind of operators. There's also one more fact. Just as yesterday we saw in the schwinger keldish theory, a largest time equation, a statement which said that you can't put difference operators out here. There's a corresponding smallest time equation which would say that you can't put such operators, the difference of uh, a right minus left tilde operator at the closest to the density matrix. So these are just correlation identities generalizing what we had yesterday. And this, I assert, they simply follow by, 
as a consequence of the simplicity of this density matrix. Okay, so a couple of comments, and, and uh, in, in, especially in regard to this, and, and an operation that I'm going to define that, that will be helpful for me in, in a second. Okay, so, you, so in the literature you find that these identities are also derived by people by demanding that you take O right of T, O left of T, by some, you map them under this KMS conjugation to O left of T minus I beta over two and O right of T plus I beta over two. Okay, this is, this is discussed in the literature. It's mostly often discussed in the CONMAT literature, although some of the other works which have been trying to understand hydrodynamics, especially uh, Hong Liu and friends, have also been using a conjugation that's very similar to this. This has the advantage that it's an involution. If you do it twice, you get back the same thing. O, o right goes to O left of T minus I beta over two, but then O left goes to O right of T plus I beta over two. So if you do it twice, it squares to one. So this is a Z2 involution. but it suffers from this problem of wanting to go up in the imaginary time. Okay, so if you know something about the analytic structure of your correlators, that's fine. I want to be agnostic and I want to generalize to, state, to situations where I have genuine time dependence, so again, I don't want to do this. So the mapping I, I'm interested in, and that, the one which would allow me to derive these identities trivially from what I had yesterday, is this mapping which involves doing this plus a imaginary time shift. So you can think of O right going to O left of T minus I beta, and O left going to O right of T. And now, given what I told you yesterday about the difference operator correlator is vanishing, this operation on that identity will give me these identities. Okay, up to a sign, but I'm, I'm, being, I'm being sort of, it's zero, so I don't care about the sign. A related point, which again I want to emphasize, is that our correlators are computed in the schwinger keldish formalism where the generating function is this guy and not the thermofield double configuration that is commonly also used in the literature, which in fact inspires the top map, the involution mapping where you take the generating function of correlators to be you split the density matrix in two and stick them across these guys. Okay. The contour here would be different. The contour here starts out as a rho beta to the half here, then goes back and then has a rho beta to the half here. And now you see what the problem is with this, with, this, with, with this formalism. Unitarity is no longer manifest unless you tell me something more. Operators inserted here are blocked by this density matrix. So unless you give me some information about analytic features of the, of the density matrix and passing operators through, I can't immediately conclude those word identities. So working with this structure is much more amenable to seeing quickly what's, what, you, what unitarity implies. It implies constraints of that kind, but doesn't 
come out so obviously in this formalism. So this is very commonly used because it, it sort of what motivates various discussions in, in the context of black holes and so on and so forth. So those of you are familiar with holography or even pre-holography of work by Israel and so on would talk about this contour, not this contour. The one we want to use is this guy. OK? Very, yeah. Yeah, from this transformation. Oh, yeah, so, so the, 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 well, the there isn't very much assumption. It's basically this conjugation. That's right. So, so the way it's derived and the, and the way it's derived in the literature is just using the KMS condition and the fact that you can conjugate operators through. Yeah. I mean, just as I was saying yesterday, where you were sort of, I was telling you, you know, if you draw the contour here, You can slide operators around and get the identities. Now you slide them around. You slide them. Think of this. OK. The difference from yes, yesterday, our contour was open. Now it's closed. Think of this as a closed contour, where this leg is really an imaginary time leg. It's sort of you come out in the real time. You go down. And then you close it in the imaginary time of the plane. And now it's, an, it's a closed abacus. So you just slide beads around. And every time you close, you, you slide in one particular direction, which is counterclockwise in my orientation, you pick up this factor. That's it. So. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, the dagger is here. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's on the whole operator. OK, so I want to now do the same thing I did yesterday of trying to encode these relations in a useful form that will let me do the low energy physics. So let me do that. And again, I won't go through the derivation in any great detail. Let me make some assertions and see, tell you that they are useful, and then explain why I need them for what I'm going to do next. All right, so we'd like to understand the KMS statement. As some operator algebra statement. And to this extent, let me define This will be useful in a second. Let me define this operator, which is this conjugation operator removed from 1, simply to ask such that delta beta acting on, say, the O left would basically be O left minus O left tilde in my notation. So right, it, I'm not doing very much, but basically what I want to ask is if I had exact thermal equilibrium, there should be some moral sense in which if I could apply, put in here O left minus O left tilde, they're, they're sort of equivalent. If I have the correlator with O left and I have the correlator with O, o, o left minus o, uh, o left tilde. So I want to sort of use this as a proxy to measure deviations from equilibrium. And there's a useful geometric way to think about it in this picture, which is why I brought this picture up, but not just kept stuck to this simple way. Now, the way I've been writing operators in quantum field theory, I've been agnostic whether they carry any indices. I've just been writing O. But you could have not just scalar operators, you could have tensor operators, you could have spinners, you could have various kinds of things. OK, if I have spinners, one important thing is that um, I have to put in a minus 1 to the f here to account for the fact that spinner operators, when they go around the thermal circle, they're anti-periodic, they're not periodic. 
But for everything else, for all bosonic operators, they're periodic. But how I take them around the thermal circle when the thermal circle is not a direct product, like here, but a vibration, cares about what the index structure of the operator is. Right? So if I have an operator on this slice, and I ask you, what is the operator up here on some other section of this geometry, you have to, roughly speaking, parallel transport it up that fiber. Okay? So in some sense, this operation, which compares operators after a whole thermal translation around this vibration, is, like a, is best thought of as a lead derivation operation. Okay? So think of all your quantum fields as some tensors living on this geometry. They live on this constant time slice. And then given that fields on this constant time slice, you can lead drag them and bring them back after one period. And then you can compare them. And this operation does exactly that. So let's think of this as some kind of lead drag operation associated with KMS commutated, um, and, and in quantum language, it's a, it's a commutated action because that's what op operators, acting on operators do. Okay, now, I could give you two independent arguments for what I'm going to say next, but let me give you the, the simpler one and, th and then show you where it comes from here. So, I have a simple bosonic operator, the, this lead derivation, that allows me to compare a quantum operator and, an, and its thermal conjugate after taking it once around the thermal circle. But yesterday, in the schwinger keldish formalism, I convinced you that there was already two. The schwinger keldish formalism requires is best viewed as redundancy, which I encoded in this BRST symmetry. So it had this QSK and Q bar SK, these nilpotent generators, which ensured the schwinger keldish identities were true. And this was, this put all operators into a single superfield. Yesterday, I had called as follows. But the key point here was that every physical operator had a fourfold realization. There was an operator, there was its ghost conjugate, there was its anti ghost conjugate, and then there was a difference. Yeah, the single copy theory got embedded into a quartet of operators. So there was a mapping from O hat, which acts on, on, on the Hilbert space, into there's a canonical embedding of this into this structure. You can think of saying that the operator algebra of your theory has been upgraded to an operator super algebra, where the super, the super space is just indexed by two Grassmann objects. Okay, why do I say all these things? The reason I say them is that I now have a bosonic operation that acts on operators. I can certainly ask how does it know about and how does it sort of work with the QSK and QBRSK. And the first thing to realize is that it cannot live by itself because it's, it's let's say it's Grassmann even or bosonic, these guys are Grassmann or let's say they're fermionic, then they're putting these two together will give me new fermionic operators. A better way to say it is that you can't have an isolated LKMS, it also has to be part of such a quartet. In other words, the operator, the structure of the algebra doesn't work. Okay? So what, what you learn from this ex little, ex this sort of just simple algebraic way of thinking is that you must have a quartet of operations that allow me to sort of ask how things move around the 
thermal circle. Which, which you can think of as a decomposition of LKMS into pieces. Which I'm going to call QKMS because there'll be a Grassman odd guy, a Q bar KMS, it's conjugate, and another Grassman even guy, Q0 KMS. And you can think of these guys as part of a structure of the form I was writing yesterday. I put some signs here, but the other structure is exactly the same. The, in particular, the direction of the arrows given by QSK and Q bar SK is isomorphic to yesterday. The point is that LKMS is like the top component. The bottom component is some other bosonic guy, which I've called Q0 here. And the middle components are two fermionic guys, Q0, Q, QKMS and Q bar KMS. So that's the easiest way to argue for this structure. I'll write the commutation relation in a second. But there's another way to argue for it by just asking the same question we asked yesterday, which was, we said, look, we have these identities involving difference operators, so they gave us some kind of BRST symmetry. Now we have identities involving differences with the tilde operators. They must have new generators that guarantee, new BRST generators that guarantee that this happens. And those generators are really this. QKMS and QBAR KMS. Okay. So these operators, O right minus O left tilde, are not QSK and QBAR SK exact, they're QKMS and QBAR KMS exact. Okay? So if you put those two things together, you would again recover this algebra. So, but let me write down that statement and then write down the commutation relations for that. I'll put this in quotes because you'll see why in a second. I think I'm missing some eyes for consistency. Let me put those back here. Okay. Okay. So that's the structure that would guarantee these identities. But you can either use that to argue for this QKMS, QBAR KMS, or you can use the fact that there is this bosonic gen generator and it has to fill out this coordinate. Completely equivalent arguments. Okay. So the statement I want you to take away from this exercise is that at the level of the, low, at the, level of the microscopic theory, 
just thinking of thermal density matrices, implementing the schwinger keldish path integral here, you have a sequence of identities which are no longer accidents, but rather consequences of the existence of a large algebra that acts on the theory. It acts on any theory. It only requires that you have some set of operators and you are in a thermal state. And you can guarantee the whole set of relations you want by asking that you not work with the double theory of the left and right, but with a quadruple theory involving these, these ghost operators. And on this structure, there's the action of a bunch of generators. Six generators, four of which are Grassmann odd, and two of which are Grassmann even. So this algebra, I'm going to give it a name because it comes from the schwinger keldish and the KMS condition. I'll call it the SK-KMS super algebra. And I'm going to try to use this later to constrain the dynamics of the theory. So all these supercharges are nilpotent. And the only non-trivial commutators are these. which should remind almost all of you of very basic supersymmetric quantum mechanics where you have Q and a Q bar which commute to a Hamiltonian. The main difference is that the thing that appears on the right-hand side is not the Hamiltonian that does time translations in real time. It's a Hamiltonian that does imaginary time translations along a very particular Euclidean thermal circle. This has consequences. I'll come back to it later. Questions? OK, so I'm sure that many of, I mean, this algebra is not familiar to most people. Um, I, I'm going to simplify it. And, and tell you some more consequences next time. But I want to give you some intuition for it. So let me remind you of a simple fact that everybody knows and uh, interpret it in a language that's reminiscent of what, what that structure is, which will also allow me to, next time to quickly generalize. OK, <clears throat> how many people know some differential geometry? Good. So, say you have a manifold. Okay, so you have some manifold. The Riemannian space for now. On this manifold, I can talk about uh, the tangent space. But actually, what I want to talk about is stru structures that are topological. So let me not talk about vectors, but let me talk about differential forms of this manifold, antisymmetric tensor fields. Okay. So there's a space of differential forms. Let's say this is an n-dimensional manifold. Then the differential forms range from um, z, uh, scalars up to top form, which is n-dimensional. N so they, that, that gives me a tensor product structure where I can to put together um, differential forms of varying degrees. And each, each differential form forms in its own vector space. So let me call that vector space of degree k, omega k. So this is a linear uh, tensor product of vector spaces. Uh, sorry, it's a direct sum. Um, on this direct sum, I have 
one natural operation. I have an exterior derivative, which is a very basic object, which takes a k form to a k plus 1 form. It takes a vector potential in electrodynamics to its field strength. Now, imagine that now you also equip yourself with vectors on this manifold. Now, associated with a vector, I can do two operations. I can take the vector, it has one index, and I can contract its index with the first index of my differential form. It's an operation I can do, and that operation is natural if you think of this vector as sitting, sort of giving you some directions of motion, and you want to sort of look at the projection of your differential form onto that vector. So this will take a differential form of degree k and map it to a differential form of degree k minus 1. It will just contract one index, so it removes an index from a, from a differential form. It makes it one, one, one rank lower. But then since I have a vector, without doing any, putting a metric, I can also take my form and drag it along. I can parallel transport it. Uh, uh, sorry, I can just lead drag it, I don't parallel transport it, because parallel transport requires a, 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 a metric structure. So the natural thing to parallel transport, actually, that's not true for differential forms, parallel transport is the same as lead drag. Um, if you're not sure about that, ask me later. Um, this lead drag takes a differential form here and moves it somewhere there. It doesn't change its degree. Three very simple operations. Here are some interesting identities. d squares to 0, i squares to 0, because you can't contract the same vector with two differential indices of an antisymmetric tensor. But uh, if you anti commute d and i, Lo and behold, you get the lead derivative. It's also a statement that uh, everybody knows. But uh, we, we use it, but we don't sort of think about it in this language. And uh, you can work out what the remaining relations are. They look like a baby version of this. These three operators can be interpreted as super operators. In fact, this is. Grassmann odd, this is Grassmann odd, this is Grassmann even. And the structure here is exactly the same thing with two derivations, a d and a d bar. Okay. It's just a generalization of this to something slightly bigger. But, and the lead derivative is a lead derivative. The point is once you have two differential operators, you no longer have one interior contraction, but you have three. So q, q, q are the interior contraction. They're the analog of Ixi. But the physical picture here is that we had this thermal circle vibration on our, on our space. Lead dragging things along was this operation of LKMS. The interior contractions are just taking projections of various objects in a Grassmann order or even fashion in those fiber directions. So thermal field theory secretly knows about super geometry. OK, so I have five minutes. Um, and uh, let me pause to ask if there are questions, and uh, then tell you some few facts about where I'm going next. What is the vector field psi in this case? The vector field psi in this case is going to be, so I'm going to sort of generalize this slightly. I, I, so here, you can think of psi as, a, suppose, M, suppose there was a vibration structure on M. You can think of psi as pointing along those fibers. Okay. So the, the usual way this is discussed is we have a manifold, and you have some group action on that manifold. So, so I take this manifold, and I act with it some, on some, some group. 
So group, all the group would do is permute points in the manifold. It would do diffeomorphism. It would take a point and move it alongside. So that's where this, this is the, con that's the context in which this is discussed. In our picture, psi is going to be an infinitesimal vector field along the fibers of our thermal fibration. The analog of psi. Because we, we basically said that we want some kind of invariance under taking this thermal fibration and slicing it in different directions. Okay. So m is going to be, the analog of m is going to be sigma, that, the spatial sections, but I'm going to upgrade a little bit because I'm not going to do just equilibrium, I'm going to do hydrodynamics. Okay. So when I describe what hydrodynamics is, you can think of the analog of m as a Lorentzian spacetime where the quantum field theory lives, and the fibers are basically thermal fibers. So psi is going to correspond to thermal directions. Yes, so it's basically going to be the, a measure of the local temperature, and it's going to be a vector field that tells you about what the local inertial direction is and what the local temperature is. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's related to the same physical picture we drew before, but it's, it's, it's going to sort of show up in a slightly different language. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you, yes, so you, 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 I, I was going to postpone that discussion till next time, but let me say what the question was. Uh, uh, I, I motivated everything by KMS condition, where I was doing discrete translations along a fixed size circle of, bit, of period beta. So this lead derivation actually takes me, it's like a winding operation, it's not an infinitesimal operation. It will be, in the context I will discuss where the circle is going to be infinitesimally small. Yeah, so, so I'm going to simplify to that context. Um, the full story in the, when the circle is finite size, I think is a, is a generalization, but it's a deformation of this algebra, which, which, which I, can, I can tell you about. But I'm going to simplify this algebra precisely in that context tomorrow. So the what, what, so question was, what, what information does the cohomology of QKMS give you? So this is why I put, uh, it doesn't give you anything, which is why I put this thing in quotes. See, the, here, the cohomology operation is on D, not on Ike psi. Right? So the QKMS guys are like the interior contraction. So you don't ask the cohomology. So what, what, OK, I, I should say the, the following statement. What you usually want to do here is you want to imagine some action on M. And you want what's usually called the equivariant cohomology for that action. For the equivariant cohomology, one easy way to describe it is to sort of talk about the principal group, the principal bundle of the, of, of the, of the equivariant group, and think of differential forms on that abstract space, which are, um, um, which are annihilated by Ike psi. But, on the, but, that, but that action on uh, the manifold is, sim is simply interior contraction. Same thing here, the Qs will sort of be used to define some kind of what are, what are in that language called basic forms. But, but the things that, whose cohomology we are interested in is still QSK and QBRSK. Because they are the ones that give you all the relations, QKMS and Q. So I, I wasn't going to do this, but the, the right way to do, think of this is sort of do another redefinition of this algebra and talk about the Cartan charges associated with linear combination of QSK and Q bar KMS, and then just do, I'll think of this as a gauge theory, which is essentially what I'm going to do next time. Sorry, if that was too fast for other people, but it's not going to be relevant for what I'm going to do, so. Any other questions? Okay, I think I'm done for the day. So let me repeat again. If